Hi, I'm Greg. Welcome to the channel. I spent the last couple of fun days repairing my iRobot Brava M6 robotic mop here. Last time it ran, it gave uh, several errors about the lid not being closed. Uh, the lid was certainly closed, but a uh, you know, quick investigation found that the hinges were all busted up in the back. I did a quick YouTube search and found that um, lots of people had the same problem. And this uh, one YouTube video that I'll link above and below shows how to take it apart and replace the lid with a part that he was offering on eBay for sale uh, for about $37. Unfortunately, it was out of stock when I checked that listing. So I thought now would be a good uh, opportunity, now that I've got all these machine tools behind me, to uh, you know put the machine shop to good use and make myself some brand new hinge lids. I don't see them well there, but I made a couple of hinge lids out of aluminum. And this video is just going to show that machining operation now, I don't really intend that uh, people are going to follow this along uh, with me because, you know, even if you had a hobby machine shop and you had a, a Brava M6 just like this with broken hinges, it's a lot of work to do this. Uh, the real point of this video, in my mind, is just showing you that, uh, you know, having a little machine shop like this really removes limits to what you can do. I mean, I used to always be really good at making things out of, uh, you know, electrical and plumbing and construction and concrete and composites and you name it. But I sort of came up short with metals. I could do some, you know, primitive uh, cutting out and, and grinding and welding. But, uh, you know, the machining operation for something as complex as this or as refined as this were out of my grasp. And, and now they're in my grasp. So uh, it really opens up a whole new world. And uh, I'm just going to show you my little steps going through this video. Um, of course, the, the, the smart thing to do would be to buy, you know, a, a replacement lid. Uh, they are available on eBay again um, from that same vendor I'll link. Uh, but the cross section of these hinges is, is really tiny. It's, it's uh, like a 3 8 inch square and it's out of a brittle clear plastic that I'm sure is going to break again. These things just aren't very robust that way. So I figure these aluminum hinges will last longer than I will and good and strong. Uh, another approach, uh, it's a magnetic switch closure here. So I could have just popped a big strong magnet on there to fool it that the lid was closed even though it wasn't. That would have worked too I suppose. Um, and there's also eBay vendors that sell broken robotic uh, M6s uh, for parts, uh, but they're pretty expensive even at that. They're, you know, $70, $80, $90 just to buy a broken one of these things just so I could get a lid. And again, I'd be worried that the lid hinges would break again. So anyway, um, just follow along and I'll uh, show you what I'm doing here with this machining operation and uh, hope you have fun. Now for the disassembly, first I popped off the mop pad. My robot uh, happens to be missing its eject button. I have no idea where it went, but I'll make one at the end of this video. For now, I just popped it off using a little wooden stick there. Then using my power driver, I moved the two screws that hold the battery in, and removed the battery for safety in this whole thing. And then I had to swap the uh, Phillips bit for a much smaller one, the smallest one I have to take off the 13, I think it's 13 individual screws here that hold the bottom on. And again, the, uh, the YouTube video by, by B. Roberts has great detail in taking this thing apart and I'd highly suggest you go look at it if you're doing this. That little square panel comes off and set aside and then I can flip the thing over and uh, take the top off. You have to be very careful to watch those wires that are connected between the base and the top while you do that. I found this loose part. It looks like it's a weight in the back left there. It's clear that the uh, stubs just broke off and I'll just set it aside for now and I'll uh, glue that back on later. Then using a pair of needle nose pliers I removed the uh, hinge pin and the little springs come out along with that. Those springs have tension for the lid. Put them back on later. And then there's the little pieces of plastic I found scattered around the base there that were originally part of the hinge. I'll have to glue them back on to uh, piece that together again. And I just figured out to make sure that these uh, wires are color coded for when I put it back together again. And yeah, they are. So then I use my little snips to cut them off. And I did them staggered to make the uh, reassembly a little neater when I put them back together. And now this is just showing me fixing that uh, weight, the little stubs. Loosen the screws a bit, put some CA glue on there and glue them back down and then tighten the screws up again after the CA is set. And that keeps it in place very well. 
So I need to make a template for machining the new hinges from the aluminum stock. But first I need to reconstruct the original plastic hinges as best I can from the five or six fragments of broken plastic that I found. This is a little tricky as you can imagine. Um, as I piece them together, I inserted a hinge pin to keep the two hinges aligned. Uh, most of it's done off, off camera here unfortunately. And after those uh, set, I added still more CAA glue uh, using accelerant spray to fill any gaps and make them stronger. At the end I was pretty confident that I had the original shape and alignment. The lid's actually in two pieces. Uh, there's a clear plastic that includes the hinges and a white plastic cap underneath it. And here I'm using an X-Acto knife to carefully separate those two parts that I found are just glued together. You'll see why I wanted them separated in a little while later. I carefully marked the hinge center lines on both the clear and the white parts before I disassembled them, just in case they were needed later on. Turns out I didn't actually need those marks, but it was safer to have them in case they were needed. Then I used an ultra-thin cutoff wheel on my Dremel to very carefully cut one of the hinges off from the lid as close as possible to the lid. Uh, both the uh, hinges have the same profile, so I chose one that was in better shape, best condition, after re-gluing to uh, use as a template. And since both hinges are the same shape, I'll make them both together from the same chunk of 6061 aluminum and cut them into two near the end of the machining steps. So here I am die camming the aluminum bar stock, then carefully measuring and scribing the profile of the hinge onto it. Well, the original plastic hinges had little beaks on them with a small hole to hold the end of the lid springs. I call it a beak because the outline looks a lot like the original Twitter bird logo. But it seems that iRobot changed the uh, design so these little beaks aren't used anymore and I'll end up grinding them off much later. I started to cut off that chunk of 6061 aluminum and I realized I might want the longer length to use as a handle to rotate the part when milling the radius over in the milling machine, as you'll see in a moment. So I boarded the cut about halfway through. And over on the mill I used a wiggler to find the hinge uh, pivot hole center and then I drilled and reamed it to the three millimeter hinge pin size. I figured I'd use the hinge pin as a pivot to machine the outer and inner radii of the part. And to keep it clamped down, I also drilled a three millimeter hole through one of my old hold down clamped ends here. Then I put the hinge pin in the vise, squared it up, then the aluminum bar on the pin, and clamped it using a hole in the clamp face. It's worked great, except that I still couldn't quite get enough swing in the radius. The long handle interfered with the column of the mill. So I ended up cutting it off after all. I used a C-clamp as shown for handle, and machined the outside and then the inside radii. There was just enough room here to get that mill in there between the part and the C-clamp. And milling the inside radii here, I had to use my smallest end mill, which is, a, I think, a two millimeter one. So it was very, very brittle and fragile. I had to be very careful. I sort of uh, poke milled the inside radius here so I wouldn't break my mill. I moved the part over to my new bench grinder around the end of the pivot point. I was doing this freehand until I realized I wanted to make a little radius jig for things like this anyway. So back on the mill, I had a small piece of the grinder T-slot material left over from earlier. And rather than just making this a radius jig for three millimeter pin as I need now, I decided to make several holes. So I can make uh, three, four, five, six, or eight millimeter draw rod as radius pins for features. And I also drilled and tapped and countersank a hole for a six millimeter flathead screw here that'll lock the jig in position in the grinder table T-slot, while still staying flush on the top side of the jig. Back over on the grinder, I made sure the table was square to the platen face, then used the new radius jig with the 3mm drill rod as a pivot to round over with the end of that hinge pivot. And this worked out great. And then back over on the mill, there was one uh, final flat surface to clean up on the inside of that hinge, which I did here easily. A little more touch up over on the belt grinder smooth things out and then finally we're ready to uh, cut the part in half to make the two individual identical hinges. The bandsaw makes quick work of that. 
So now each half is face milled in turn to get them cleaned up and proper thickness. Here I decided to leave a little additional thickness uh, where it'll mate to the lid so that there's a little extra room for the mounting screws to come. Of course I did the same face milling operation to the second hinge piece, but this is where the hinges diverge from being identical for the first time because uh, the additional thickness needs to be on the inside face of each hinge. So now they're mirror images of each other and now I have unique left and right hinge pieces to keep track of. I forgot to video this, but I also had to drill a small hole and cut a small channel into each hinge that retains the spring that provides the tension for the uh, opening of the lid. So there are four small 22 gauge wires that connect the base to some LED electronics in the lid. Remember I cut those wires to removing the lid earlier. In the original plastic hinge, the wires are routed through a small channel that's molded into the right hinge. I want to create a similar channel for the wire routing in my aluminum hinge. So the straight section of the channel is simple enough to do with the small end mill and the y-axis crank. And for the curved section, uh, I'll again use the hinge pivot to rotate it around an axle. For the axle, this time I've cut the head off a long 3mm machine screw and mounted the threaded portion into my mill vise, squared up vertically. The hinge is then clamped through the pivot hole on a threaded rod with a washer and a 3mm nut. So now I can use a pair of pliers to carefully rotate the hinge around the pivot to cut the curved section of the wire channel uh, with a small end mill. I cut about halfway through the thickness of the hinge which provides just enough space for the small wires as you'll see later. And here's a picture of the two completed hinges showing the wire channel in the right hand one. So here I've installed the hinges and their springs into the base. Uh, it was just going to be a quick test fit, so I wasn't recording, but it worked so well that I decided to just leave them in place. I also cut a small piece of uh, 16th inch aluminum that will bridge the space between the two hinges, making the attachment of the lid even stronger, as you'll see a little later. So here I'm using CA glue to temporarily attach that bridge between the hinges, and also ensuring that the hinge action is good with it in place. I used a 2.5 millimeter bit to drill through the bridge and into the hinge with everything in place. I didn't drill fully into the hinge just yet, uh, but just enough to leave a mark, a mark for the hole position. I managed to squeeze in two screws into each hinge diagonally across uh, the square hinge top surface. Then I moved the bridge piece and used vice grip pliers to hold the hinge for proper tap size hole drilling, 3 millimeter tap size. Uh, the squareness of the drilling was just by eye, but I've gotten pretty good at that, and they ended up quite acceptable. Then I tapped the holes for 3mm screws, and uh, screwed down the hinge bridge to that one side. I repeated the drilling and tapping on the other hinge, of course, and installed the hinge bridge across to test its clearance in action. All good. Then I removed one of the screws from each side, and installed 3mm transfer screws instead. And then with a piece of painter's tape on the bottom of the lid for better visibility and using my hand to hold the hinge down from underneath, I carefully placed the lid into its proper latch position while pressing down on the transfer screws. And that left little marks on the bottom of the, you know, through the tape on the bottom lid surface. And off camera, I drilled through those marks and screwed the lid down to the hinge bracket to test the fit. And thankfully, all was good again. Everything closed and latched properly. So then I removed the bridge and used the holes in that bridge to mark the other two holes in the lid and drilled them out too. This is all done off camera. Uh, to allow for the thickness of the bridge metal, um, I used snips to cut away the same size rectangle from the white bottom cover, being really careful not to cut the wires that uh, come close to that edge. It seems that most of the cutting was done off frame again, so I'm sorry about that. You can see, you can see the final result here. I used contact cement uh, to join both lid surfaces again, you know, waiting the five minutes for the contact cement to become tacky. And then uh, I was very careful to route the four wires through the small grooves that are supplied in the lid, in the clear lid for the purpose. I drilled a hole in the bridge piece for the wires to come through. I made a corresponding little depression in the lid bottom to avoid pinching the wires under the bridge. And then routed the wires through that hole and again use contact cement to glue the bridge to the lid. So it'll make a nice strong connection there and ensuring the screw holes were aligned, of course. 
Oh, uh, I'm using the three millimeter screws with rather large rounded heads, and I found there was a little bit of interference between them because they're, they're so close together in the, in the hinges. So I chucked each of the four screws lightly in my drill and ran the heads up against the uh, belt sander to remove just a smidge of the circumference. So now it's time to reconnect those wires. Uh, and this is pretty simple. I started by stripping all the wires, then routing them uh, from the lid through the base cutout for the hinge where they originally routed. And then I uh, reattached the lid to the new hinge bracket with the four three millimeter screws and tested its closing and latching. It's perfect and it's solid. Next, I coerced the wires into that little channel that I machined into the hinge, poking them in with a stick when needed. And once they're all tucked into place, I use CA glue with some accelerant to encase them and keep them in place in that channel. And here you can see them tucked in there. Before connecting the wires, I slipped a large piece of black heat shrink over all four of them. This will uh, encase the entire set of connections at the end. Then for each of the four wires, I slipped a smaller piece of yellow heat shrink over one end, twisted the wires together, soldered them, then slipped the yellow heat shrink up over the connection and used a heat gun to shrink it in place. Once all four were done, I slid the large black heat shrink over the whole set. Uh, notice that when I cut the wires, I staggered them so that the connections uh, aren't you know, one big lump. So the black fits over top of the four and uh, the heat gun finishes it up. Finally, the wires are routed through the clip connection in the base where they were originally and taped down. I did that off camera to, uh, to keep them secure. Now we're in the home stretch. The cover is slipped onto the base, making sure not to pinch any wires in between. Then it's flipped over and the 13-ish screws are reinstalled. I again uh, tested the lid opening and latching and I'm really liking it. It feels so much more solid than the original. And I reinstalled the battery and put it onto its charging base and let it boot up. The LED ring around the lid lit up as expected and the musical trill indicates all's well and ready to work. One final small item to look after. I noted at the start that the patty jack button is mysteriously missing from my robot. I took a picture, uh, sorry it's out of focus, and I measured and modeled a, a new button in Fusion 360, as you can see here. The long post uh, contacts a sprung lever inside the unit to eject the mop head, and the two hooks are what keep it from popping out again. So I sliced and printed it out on my trusty Ender, uh, Ender 3 V2. Uh, believe it or not, the very first attempt was perfect. Uh, well, almost. Uh, the long post snapped off too easily, so I printed the second one with the infill set to 100%, or in other words, pure plastic. So it's as strong as it can be for PLA. It snaps into place and stays there. And as you can see here, it works perfectly to eject the mop as it should. So that's a wrap. Again, the point of this video wasn't to show you how to make your own Brava Jet hinges. It's much bigger than that. The point is that with a hobby machine shop, you can make most anything from metal and have fun doing it. So as always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.